Uh, welcome back. A uh, series of lectures here on Western civilization. This is History 1121. I'm going to talk about uh, domestication of plants and animals for a few minutes. <clears throat> In our last uh, meeting, we talked about the uh, Paleolithic and Neolithic eras, the Old Stone Age and the New Stone Age. Uh, we characterize uh, Paleolithic man as nomadic, moving about in small groups, constantly in search of shelter, food, and water. Uh, Neolithic, I want you to associate with farming, with agriculture. This is the, uh, the d dramatic shift in human history. Uh, with Neolithic man, you get large populations, uh, settled uh, uh, populations, cities, you get specialization. Uh, this is all due, of course, to the uh, surplus of food now available. Uh, the reason we have a surplus of food is, of course, a uh, Neolithic man discovered that he could uh, domesticate wild animals and plants and to make them useful to him. So we're going to talk about some of these today. <clears throat> I thought I would give you a, a list here of the uh, plants and animals available for domestication. Uh, first in Southwest Asia, in uh, the Fertile Crescent or in Mesopotamia, where we think of as Western civilization beginning in the uh, Sumerian city-states. And then contrast that <clears throat> with the plants and animals available for domestication in the New World, in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, this should give us a good idea <clears throat> of the differences and why the Old World uh, perhaps grew faster and perhaps a bit more complex, more larger uh, settlements than in the New World. Um, is due to domestication of plants and animals and the large abundance of these that are available in the old world. Uh, let's start with animals. <clears throat> uh, both the old world and the new world have dogs, uh, but there's a distinct difference in the duties of these animals. Uh, the dog in the new world in North or South America does not have to herd. Uh, and he still provides companionship and protection and, and things like that, but he does not have to herd uh, because there are no large domesticated animals in the New World to herd. And we'll get further into this in a bit. Um, in the Old World, you have cattle, and cattle are key, um, probably the foundation of human wealth. Uh, cattle provide us with uh, meat and with uh, milk and clothing uh, and leather for shoes and coats and hats and belts, um, milk, cheese, cream, on and on and on, butter, uh, items that you use every single day, items you've probably already used this morning uh, are derived from cattle. And of course, cows eat something that we have no interest in, grass. So the cow turns grass into everyday uh, items that are quite uh, uh, valuable to us. Uh, so cows are available in the old world, but not in the new. Camels, uh, the domesticated camel. Think about the impact this has had on Arabic culture. Uh, would Islam, for instance, uh, born deep in the uh, Arabian Peninsula, uh, would it have been able to, <coughs> excuse me, to, uh, uh, to expand out of Arabia and then across North Africa, into Central Asia, into Europe, uh, without the domesticated camel? Horses, uh, available in the old world, not in the new. Um, horses will be brought over uh, by Columbus and the explorers that follow him. Horses, uh, mules, donkeys, these all provide us with uh, transportation. Uh, they provide us with uh, a beast of burden, power, labor power. And of course they provide us with manure. We're an agricultural people and we need manure to uh, help grow our crops. So these are all key creatures in Southwest Asia, but you don't find them in the New World. Sheep and goats, again, sheep provide clothing and food. Goats provide uh, food as well. And of course, uh, goat's milk is quite often <clears throat> turned to cheese. Um, so these are valuable creatures. 
and uh, easy to maintain, easy to herd, uh, but they're not available in the new world, just the old. Pigs, uh, pig is a special uh, domesticated animal. Uh, it's obvious what we derive from it, uh, meat in various ways. Um, it's available in Southwest Asia, but it's not available in the New World. Now, once the pig is brought over to North and South America by the European explorers, uh, the pig will begin to uh, uh, tear up the, uh, the landscape. Uh, pigs will root and root and root endlessly. If you've ever rubbed, uh, if you've ever rubbed the, uh, the nose of a pig, it's a, it's a hard callous snout and it's like a little shovel and it constantly digs. This of course disrupts the, uh, the landscape and causes erosion. So uh, when Columbus came over and uh, the other Europeans, they brought pigs with them and many of these pigs got loosed, loose. Uh, they became feral or wild pigs and have a dramatic impact on the, uh, the landscape of the New World. Pigs are also <clears throat> less valuable to humans because of their, uh, well, they compete with us for food. Uh, pigs like the same thing you like, which is carbohydrates. And uh, pigs are willful, intelligent animals, and they compete with humans uh, for these essential nutrients. Chickens, of course, uh, we have feathers, we get eggs, and flesh, um, <clears throat> honeybees. Uh, we all like something sweet. Uh, honeybees are domesticated in the old world, but not the new, where they're not available. Uh, we have water buffalo in the old world. Again, beast of burden. Now, that's a pretty strong lineup. And I should add the, uh, the silkworm to that lineup. Uh, silkworm have a major impact on trade, uh, linking east and west together. Uh, as Europeans desire, the, the fine fabric made from silk. That's a very strong lineup of domesticated animals available in the old world. Uh, now what about the new world, just in contrast? In the new world you have dogs, but like I said, uh, dogs don't herd in the new world because there's no large domesticated animal to herd. <clears throat> in the new world, in the Andes in South America, you have alpacas and uh, llamas. These are small pack animals. Uh, nimble of foot, they can negotiate those steep, difficult trails in the Andes. Again, small pack animals, uh, they cannot carry a heavy load. In the New World, you have turkeys, and our benefits there are obvious. And then finally, uh, guinea pigs. Uh, guinea pig is a standard dietary uh, staple in South America. Uh, roasted guinea pig on a skewer, uh, seasoned, is a common uh, dietary item. So if you, look at this, if you look at these two lists as uh, lineup cards for baseball teams, you'll see that the old world um, looks like an all-star team compared to the new world that has very few uh, domesticated animals available. Domesticated plants. Um, I read somewhere years ago, I think botanists, some botanists said that there's something in the neighborhood of 20,000 uh, uh, species of grasses on this planet. Uh, we've managed to domesticate about a dozen or so of them and most of them are in Eurasia um, as opposed to the New World. In the Old World you have barley, of course we feed this to animals, we help us to make beer uh, and bread, you have lentils and onions. Uh, wheat of course is the heavy hitter. Uh, wheat is um, uh, we make bread and pasta, this is a staff of life. You have rye also uh, for livestock, uh, for bread, uh, oats, um, rice. Can you imagine the culture of East Asia uh, without rice? These are fundamental, foundational grains, uh, wild grasses that have been domesticated and made useful for man. And of course we can store these too. You've all seen the large silos in the uh, uh, out in the Midwest to store grain. Uh, the only domesticated grass available in the New World is, uh, is corn. Now corn is, uh, is key, it's quite important obviously. It's, it's difficult to find any processed food made nowadays that doesn't have corn in it in some fashion. But nevertheless, um, you can see that the available, <coughs> excuse me, 
you can see the availability of plants available for domestication in the old world far surpasses uh, that that's available in the new world. Uh, I'm going to make a few more comments here uh, about this transition from, neo, from Paleolithic to Neolithic with domestication of plants and animals. Um, uh, by domesticating animals, we come into contact with animal diseases. Uh, over time, over millennia, this allows human beings to develop immunities uh, to these diseases that are animal-born. Uh, one of the great catastrophes in human history is after Columbus's arrival in the New World, the, uh, the natives there, the indigenous people of the Caribbean, began to die off in massive numbers. This, of course, is because they have no immunity to these diseases, having never been around cows and chickens and other animals that carry these diseases. So this is a, this is a key factor in the uh, conquering of the New World by the Europeans. We should also at least mention the fact that in the, uh, uh, in the old world where animals, large numbers of animals are domesticated and people begin to settle there in Mesopotamia, you see uh, an accumulation of garbage. Uh, Paleolithic people did not have garbage. They were constantly on the move. Uh, they were constantly looking for something to eat and they did not settle down. Uh, but Neolithic people did in large numbers. Now garbage begins to accumulate and there has to be some answer, some, uh, some civic infrastructure uh, to try to take care of this accumulation of garbage, which of course breeds uh, disease as uh, vermin uh, flock to the garbage. Um, there has to be some practical way of dealing with this problem that's brought about by domestication of plants and animals. So um, I hope that gives you a little bit of an introduction to the differences between Paleolithic and Neolithic, uh, at least with regards uh, to domesticated plants and animals. Thank you.